Good morning. My name is Pastor Mike Brink, and I'm so excited to welcome you to this week's online service. We at Park Avenue Baptist Church would love to connect with you. So if you have a prayer request or have a question about today's sermon, fill out the connection card in the comments section below. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching with us, and we hope you're encouraged by what you hear. Good morning, Park Avenue Baptist Church. Thanks so much for being with us today. We are going to be starting into our new sermon series, working our way through the book of Ephesians. And our overarching theme for this study is going to be uh, beggars no more because uh, Paul was writing this letter uh, from prison to the believers in the city of Ephesus because uh, he saw that they were living as spiritually impoverished people and wanted to remind them of all the riches and benefits that were theirs in Christ. And so in Christ ends up becoming a key phrase as we work our way through uh, the book of Ephesians. So I would encourage you as we're reading today and in future weeks to take note of phrases that are related to Christ. Um, in Christ, because of Christ, through Christ, all of those things, it's woven all throughout the fabric of this powerful book. Today, we want to look at the first 14 verses of chapter 1. I want to read verses 1 and 2 for you. Uh, it says, This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I am writing to God's holy people in Ephesus, who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Uh, that's verses 1 and 2. Now, I want to read uh, beginning in verse 3 down through verse 14. Uh, it is uh, in the translation that I'm using, uh, 15 sentences. But something that's kind of interesting that in the original Greek language that Paul would have written in, verses 3 to verses 14 are one single sentence. It's almost like Paul got started expressing all of this and didn't know where to stop until he had expressed all of it, and then he took a breath and placed a period. And so I want to read these verses for us, and then we're going to talk our way down through these. All praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us, who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us, along with all wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. God's purpose was that we Jews, who were the first to trust in Christ, would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this 
so we would praise and glorify him. Uh, now, before we start working our way through those verses, uh, a couple things I want to point out for us. First of all, the human heart was made to worship. It's the way God designed us. And idolatry happens when we make good things that he made into God things, things that we worship, things that we seek to find purpose and meaning in uh, apart from him. Every sin problem can be traced back to a worship problem. Uh, when we wander into sin, it is because on some level we have started to trust something else more than we trust God. When we start lying, we have uh, decided that the version of truth that we can spin to escape trouble, to win people's approval, whatever that may be, is more important, is more reliable than God is. And so we need to be mindful of that. And lastly, even I, it's even idolatry when we worship the God we imagine rather than the God who truly is. Um, God has given us his word to help give us a reliable source of understanding of who he is. Now, we're not going to fully comprehend him because he's God and we're not. Uh, but we're in great danger when we start to say, well, I don't believe that God would do that, or I don't believe that God would hold that opinion or feel that way or do that thing. Uh, when we're just pulling that out of our own imagination and our own sense of, of justice or fairness, um, if that's not in alignment with what God has expressed about himself in his word, we are setting up an idol. We are creating a false God of our design rather than submitting us, ourselves to God as he is. And so it's a good reminder for us there. Um, a story is told about a rabbi who wandered by a Roman castle. And he was lost in thought. And as he wandered by, from up above, uh, a, a stern voice uh, called out and said, Who are you and what are you doing here? And the rabbi was startled. He looked up, saw that it was one of the Roman guards. And, and rather than answering him, uh, he asked a question instead. He said, uh, how much did they pay you to do that? And uh, the guard was a little startled, but he answered him, told him how much he was paid per day. And uh, the rabbi said to him, I will pay you twice as much if you will come to my house every morning and ask me those two questions. Who are you and what are you doing here? And it's a, it's a reminder of how easily we lose track of those two key things. They are two very important things. The idea of identity, who am I? And the idea of purpose, what am I doing here? And all of humanity grapples with those things. Um, and the interesting thing is when we have questions there, our most natural instinct is to look inward. And Paul in this passage suggests a very different uh, strategy. Uh, he says, rather than looking inward, look upward. Look to God and discover who he is. And that's really what he's unpacking here for the Ephesian believers. He wants them to understand in the course of this entire book, this big idea that we have been given everything we need in Christ. Uh, it's very true that in these areas of identity and purpose, we get very tangled up, very tripped up. And when we work frantically to achieve identity and purpose, it's crushing. It's an overwhelming pursuit. But when we rest in God's provision and receive the identity and purpose he has for us, it's actually freeing. That weight is lifted off of us because our identity and purpose are, are bestowed upon us rather than being something we have to, to fight and scramble for and try desperately to discover. 
So today, uh, we're going to be operating under this basic premise that God is worthy of our praise, because that's the spot where Paul starts. And then he continues through this passage to unpack uh, what God the Father does for us, what Christ the Son does for us, and what God the Spirit does for us. And by looking at those things, he points us back to this overarching truth that God is worthy of our praise. And when we recognize all that the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all that they have accomplished for us, the natural response is to praise. So I'd like to work our way down through this passage. This is kind of the format that we're going to follow and discover some things together. So let's get started. Verse 3. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Why? Because we are united with Christ. So again, verse 3, we see our first occurrence of this uh, Christ-centric thinking that... Um, if all of these truths are like spokes on a bicycle tire, then Christ is the center of that, where everything connects. We continue. Oh, actually, want to notice a couple things here. I love the inclusive language that leaves very little wiggle room for us here. He says, all praise to God, and he has given us every spiritual blessing because we are united with Christ. Verse 4 says, Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Uh, what an amazing thing that when God looks at us, he does not see our faults. He does not see our shortcomings. He sees the righteousness of Christ. Now, there's something powerful here that's very different for us. Um, and normally, when we hear that we've been chosen for something, the natural question for us is, well, why were you chosen? Um, if uh, teams are being picked up for a sporting event, uh, the most skilled players typically uh, get chosen first, or maybe the best uh, team players uh, that aren't uh, showing off their own skills, but really function together with the team. Uh, and those people are able to say, well, I was chosen first because I'm good at this. And for most of us, when we're chosen, we immediately start to try to identify, uh, why, why is it? Uh, why was I chosen? And the interesting thing for us here is that... Uh, there's no merit that we bring that explains our being chosen by God because God chooses based on his own love and on the merits of Christ. And so if we go, oh, why did you choose me? Oh, it must be because I'm such a good person. Well, no, you're not. Um, and he didn't choose you for that reason. He chose you because it brought him great delight to choose you. And that's a powerful thing. Let's continue in verse 5. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. Uh, God delights in choosing and adopting and expanding his family. He finds delight in the children he loves. And that's a powerful thing for us to grapple with. Now, this word adoption uh, takes things to an even higher level than being chosen. Uh, because um, verse 15 tells us, but even before I was born, um, or excuse me, got tripped up there. This is Galatians 1.15, another passage that Paul authored that helps reinforce this idea here. He says here, But even before I was born, God chose me and called me 
by his marvelous grace. Then it pleased him to reveal his son to me so that I would proclaim the good news about Jesus to the Gentiles. So Paul recognized here that even before he was born, God had selected him and God had called him and given him identity and purpose. And Paul understood that was not based on anything Paul had done because he was not even born yet. He hadn't had the opportunity to do anything to earn any sort of favor. This was entirely God's doing. That's a powerful thing. Uh, adoption indicates a close nurturing parent-child bond. It's different uh, than just being selected maybe as a teammate or as an employee. Uh, adoption uh, creates familial bonds. Uh, a, being adopted means that you have been granted all of the rights and privileges that belong to the father's children. That's an amazing thing when we think about that spiritually. And adoption has not just vertical benefits, but it also has horizontal benefits. I have a special bond with my brothers and sisters in Christ because we have been adopted into the same family. That is powerful. In verse 6, we see, so we Praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. I think this is incredibly powerful because of this idea of his grace being poured out on us. Uh, there are so many different things that could have been expressed here. Um, he could have said, well, God has dripped his glorious grace on us. He could have said, well, God has sprinkled his glorious grace on us. He could have even said God has splashed his glorious grace on his adopted children. And he didn't choose any of those expressions. He chose to say that God has poured out his glorious grace. That's the idea of being, uh, being completely saturated. That has the idea of abundance. Uh, because you don't pour out something uh, that you're trying to use sparingly. Uh, that idea of pouring out just tells us how great our Father's grace actually is. And so verses 4, 5, and 6, these three rich verses show us the Father God has chosen and has adopted us. So that's the first of the three members of the Godhead, God the Father, and just how rich uh, his provision for us has been, and we are just getting started. Next, we're going to go to verses 7 through 12 to see what Christ the Son does for us. Verse 7, he is so rich in kindness and grace, and that speaking of God, God is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. Again, I want to point out the word showered his kindness on us could be because again, that has the idea of lavishness, of extravagance. It's not an economy of scarcity. Uh, just like his grace, his kindness is in great abundance and he showers it on us. Uh, verse 9. Uh, God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And what is that plan? Well, Paul spells it right out for us in the next verse. Verse 10, he says, and this is the plan. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. And that is powerful. Uh, we kind of resist that a little bit because we're like, oh, under the authority of Christ. Mm, I don't like I don't like anybody telling me what to do. And our, our resistance to authority 
is often because we have been under corrupt, selfish, abusive, self-serving authority. And Jesus Christ is anything but. So there's a richness here that at the right time, God has a timetable. He will bring everything together under the authority of Christ. That is a powerful and reassuring truth for us. Um, it can also be a bit of a frustrating truth because uh, we live in the awkward space between the now and the not yet. I would encourage you, uh, don't be content. Keep growing and changing. Allow God to be at work within you. But also, we need to remember that you are no longer who you were, but you are not yet who you will be. So continue in the process of submitting to him. Don't become discouraged that you don't have it down perfectly. God doesn't love you because of your supposed perfection. He loves you because of the merits of Christ. Verse 11. Furthermore, as if what we've already read is not enough. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, so again, Christ is central to all of this, we have received an inheritance from God. For he chose us in advance and he makes everything work out according to his plan. Now, that does not say he makes everything work out according to our plans. It's according to his plan, and we can find rest there if we will choose to. And then uh, verse 12, God's purpose was that we Jews who were the first to trust in Christ would bring praise and glory to God. So that's the start of something that is going to continue, but we take a, a, a brief pause there and recognize that verses 7 through 12 remind us that while God the Father chooses and adopts us, Christ the Son redeems us. Now, you probably have already noticed that there's a lot of intertwining. It's not like God the Father is contained to verses 4 through 6 and we don't hear about him again. No, we do. They're all intertwined, and you will continue to see that as we move into our last couple of verses, uh, verses 13 and 14, and look at what does God the Spirit do for us. So he's talked about God's plan for the Jews, what they would do, and then it just continues that same thought. Remember, this is all part of one long sentence. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. Um, that is powerful, but that is not the end. The last phrase tells us why. Um, he did this so that we would praise and glorify him. So let's just unpack the ideas that are here, or at least some of the ideas that are here in these last two verses. Um, there is no fear of identity theft in this because God, the Spirit, indwells believers and is an identifying mark. Um, I heard it expressed this way. I really appreciated this, that having the Holy Spirit always with you is the first installment of your gradually unfolding inheritance. It's almost like a down payment that has been given to us that, oh, you think this is good. There is more to come. But while you are waiting, you have this reminder, this presence of God with you uh, to reassure you and to help you along your journey. And that's a powerful thing for us to consider together. Uh, so our third section here, uh, verses four to six, 
God the Father chooses and adopts us. Verses 7 through 12, Christ the Son redeems us. And in verses 13 and 14, the Holy Spirit seals us. Uh, there is abundant provision here that is made for us. Um, this breaks down, but I think it's interesting that we think of um, Christ's sacrifice for us on the cross. Well, that's past tense for us. We think about the Holy Spirit indwelling us. Well, that's going on right now. That's present tense. And our enjoyment of the benefits of being adopted into God's family, chosen by him, and being at home with him forever. Well, that's future tense. So the three members of the Godhead, they work together and cover all of the bases so beautifully and so completely. And so that brings us to how does this passage begin and how does it end? Uh, this is a kind of like a sandwich with all these great ingredients in the middle, all the ways that God has provided for us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What's the bread on each side? Well, let's look at that. Verse 3 says, All praise to the Father who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Why? Because we are united with Christ. And then verse 14 ends this section. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. So God's provision for us in all these amazing ways is the fuel that keeps the fire of worship, the fire of praise, burning brightly in our hearts. So we need to be a people that respond to what God has done for us, that we recognize the abundance of the provision, and that we worship him. So, just to review, God the Father chooses and adopts us, so praise him. Christ the Son redeems us, so praise him. The Holy Spirit seals us, so praise him. Praise is the natural response of a believer's heart when that believer recognizes all that he has received. And this is is just Paul getting started. This is the opening volley of this message that he has for the Ephesians and by extension for us. So, big idea as we go through this entire series is that we have been given everything we need in Christ. Let that soak into you for a moment. Take a deep breath of that. We feel great needs. But everything we need has been given to us in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your provision for us. Thank you for the reminder from Paul here in this opening chapter of Ephesians of all that you have done and all that you continue to do. God, help our hearts to be receptive as we learn more and more and are reminded of what a great God you are. We thank you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being with us. Have a great week.